epistle appointed to be read for this, the second Sunday of Lent, is taken from the first epistle of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Brethren, even as you have learned from us how you ought to walk and to please God, as indeed you are walking, we beseech and exhort you in the Lord Jesus to make even greater progress. For you know what precepts I have given to you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from immorality, that every one of you learn how to possess his vessel in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and overreach his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all these things. As we have told you before and have testified, for God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness in Christ Jesus our Lord and the Holy Gospel is taken from St. Matthew, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. At that time, Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and was transfigured before them. And his face shone as the sun, and his garments became white as snow. And behold, there appeared to them, Mos to, him, to, to them Moses and Elias talking together with him. Then Peter addressed Jesus, saying, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us set up three tents here, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Uh, and as he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And on hearing it, the disciples fell on their faces and were exceedingly afraid. And Jesus came near and touched them and said to them, Arise, do not be afraid. But lifting up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus cautioned them, saying, Tell the vision to no one, for the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Thus for this Sunday's Holy Gospel. My beloved people, I point out some points in the bulletin. There are several items but uh, the main ones that uh, you should be aware of, first of all, that there is catechism class this morning downstairs, as usual. And I caution you ahead of time to please be aware of the fact that next su Sunday, or next Saturday night, we change our clocks. So next Sunday morning. Be very, very cautious that there is no mistake about this. And after this Mass this morning, the first Sunday, uh, Father Sebastian will have the usual oblate meeting. We have said before that being an oblate does not necessarily and does not place upon you additional burdensome uh, devotions, different, different burdensome uh, prayers and such like, uh, and that it is really the, being an oblate is, in the, uh, is primarily di uh, aimed at taking part in the uh, good works that are performed in a monastery. Now, uh, there are uh, some who are oblates that could very well be here for these meetings on Sunday morning, but for whatever reason they choose not to be. And I uh, ask those of you who know who they are, and you do, uh, exert your influence on them, that they, be, that they do attend these little meetings. Just 10 minutes extra. 
can we not give 10 additional minutes extra to the service of our holy religion? It's a good question. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. And today's bulletin also uh, is a very important <clears throat> uh, instruction. It is the conclusion of a two-part instruction on temptations. Uh, unfortunately, we're, the, the, the first part of this uh, instruction came at a much earlier date, and we were not able to follow through with the second part right behind it. And um, if you still have, and I hope you do, that first part, I forget the number, you can get find it for yourselves, that you put the two together. <clears throat> My dear people, we are under the influence of a lot of people, a lot of men, some of, some of them are certainly priests, but somehow or other, we are all subject to teachings that are simply not right, that are wrong. And there are people, once the incision has been made of an erroneous teaching, that wound will always be visible and always give trouble. I want you to study this concerning temptations very, very, very closely. There are those who teach erroneously. And once the teaching has, once the word has gone out into the wavelengths of space, where it stops, nobody knows. There are those who teach, and they appear to have, they give the appearance of having absolute proof, undeniable proof, you know. And they teach that just one temptation, just one, is a mortal sin. How can this be? And you know, the sad part of it all is that because they saw it in print or they saw it in the, in the internet or somebody said it, it is gospel. Which one of you sitting in here in this room right now have not had already this morning have committed dozens and dozens and dozens of mortal sins. If that's the case. Did you follow me? Do you see how utterly out of place and how utterly ridiculous the whole thing is? If that's the case, our blessed Lord himself committed several more of the sins when the devil was tempting him, bringing him all around the place to show him what he could give him. No? No, my dear people. Which one of you in here does not have constantly before him a parade parade, a never-ending parade of interrupted thoughts, first thoughts. Which one of you? Myself included. You see, our Catholic belief suffers violence from the violent. 
And many people, many people's consciences are very much distressed and disturbed and put under pressure because of mistaken teaching. The Catholic religion is very reasonable, always has been, and handed down to us by those who kept it reasonable. Is when we get out into left field or whatever, back to getting lost in tall weeds, everything is all right. This morning, <clears throat> while we're on the subject of temptation, we will just take a few minutes' time to study a few a bits about today's gospel. A blessed Lord, as best we can figure, by this time, had already passed through about two years of the three that he had assigned to his work. <clears throat> and during those two years, he had instructed his disciples, his apostles rather, his apostles primarily. He had inst instructed them over and over again. And yet, no matter how much he worked to instruct them, they completely failed always and always to understand exactly what he meant. And all they could see in him was his humanity. And they saw his miracles, and they wondered at his miracles. Yet, somehow or other, they could not really grasp that there was something over and above what they were looking at. They made about Christ, the living God, the Son of the... all those nice, wonderful things, and yet somehow they did not comprehend. Our Lord knew that. And he lost his patience sometime, and he scolded, but to no avail. And now that our Lord himself knew the time was drawing near, he had to work overtime to persuade them that there was something that he had to go through that he could not avoid and that they would have to understand. And he kept saying that the Son of Man will have to die, will have to die, will have to be killed. He couldn't grasp that. Only just days before, not long before perhaps, uh, again, we do not know precise time, uh, even in, in addition to the very astounding miracles that he was performing all over, everywhere, everywhere, and everywhere. There was one that got everybody's attention for good and for bad. And that was that after the people had been following him along, uh, it was getting later on in the day, perhaps, there were many thousands of people. We're told that there were some 5,000 men not to speak of women and children. So there were a lot of people. And our Lord had compassion on them. And he asked what he knew was a silly question because he already knew the answer to what he was going to do. What do you have here that we can feed these people with? And a very silly answer came something like, well, there's a little boy here who's got uh, five or six loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Well, uh, what are we going to do? How can these two fish and five or six loaves of bread 
feed several thousand people. And so he made them all sit down. And out of those few loaves of bread and a couple of fishes, he fed them all, all they wanted to eat. And to make sure that his point was well taken, our Lord left nothing out. And if we think we, he did leave something out, it is because of our stupidity and ignorance. Our Lord left nothing out. And in order to make sure that everybody knew exactly what happened, he says, now go and gather up the fragments and put them in the in bushels or boxes or whatever they had to put them in so that nothing would go to waste. And lo and behold, after many thousand people had eaten all they wanted, they gathered up several big baskets of, 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 of fragments, leftovers. They came from two fish and five or six loaves of bread. Now that is something. It got everybody's attention, including the pagans and everybody that was listening. This was something. You would think, therefore, that the apostles would certainly have taken a cue from something of this nation and nature in the right way. The people were trying to make him king, and the apostles were delighted at that because that is what they wanted of him. They wanted him to be an earthly king. And yet he was talking about, I will die, I will die, I will die. How can this be? How can this be? That here, such a prominent one will be killed and will have to die. For what? For what will he have? Why will he have to die? They believed, yet they did not understand. We believe, don't we? But you see, in so many of these things, my beloved people, we are told to believe. We are not told to understand. And so our apostles continued not knowing or com comprehending what was being said to them. He knew it. And so on this particular day that we read about this morning, he took three of them. St. Peter, who was, he had, he had just made head of the apostles officially upon this rock, took Peter, he took James, took John. He didn't take them all. He just took three. And he went up a high mountain. He seemed to like high mountains. I guess it's because getting up high off the level of the earth, you could see things a lot clearer in the good, clean air that was up there on the high mountains. And he took these three up there, and of course they were talking as always, talking, talking, talking. When he came to the proper place, and they stopped. He had to show something. He had to, in order to try to put the point across, when all of a sudden, all of a sudden, without any explanation, he became brilliant as the sun. His face, we're told, was as brilliant as the sun. And the clothes he was wearing turned, and we heard this morning, as white as snow, as brilliant. 
something all of a sudden this light that was in him this, this, this brilliance that was in him that was locked up as it were in a lantern which they could not see all of a sudden this light burst forth from this enclosure his body his human body for them to see he was so magnificent he presented himself to them these three he presented himself to them as what he was God and he was talking to Moses and to Elias wonder why he chose these two men Elias perhaps the greatest of the prophets Moses he was the lawgiver he was the one that wrote down what God himself told him to write down and our blessed Lord went about saying I did not come here to destroy the law I came here it's my business it's my work to fulfill the law and that you then must learn of me you must learn of what I have got to say and so here he was talking to Moses the lawgiver and to Elias the great prophet about the law probably and about things that pertain to Moses and, and pertain to the prophet and Peter as always saying things that it would have been better for him to listen rather than to talk until later days of course he says let's build three whatever tent structures buildings whatever I don't know when he was interrupted all of a sudden when the cloud came down in all of its majesty in all of its unbelievable astounding importance where they had to they fell on their faces frightened terrified at what was going on and then he came and touched them and it was all over he showed these three who he was and you know even then even then were not these squabbling about who was going to sit at his right hand and his left hand when they got into the kingdom even so even after they were right there in terror struck it didn't dawn upon them this is significant you know sometimes we think because we have read or studied or interpreted or whatever else we may have done that we know no not at all not at all we do not know until the grace of God touches and then we know with or without instruction the apostles did not really know what were they talking about when on the very last day the very last hour the very last minute that they were uh, that he was here with them what in the world were they talking about on the way up another high mountain 
that were still talking about the kingdom. What kingdom? What kingdom? A few days later, when there was a rumble, they were, first of all, they were scared silly. I'm overworking the word silly this morning. They were frightened. They locked themselves up in a room. When all of a sudden, in spite of the fact they were locked in the room, they heard rumblings and noise and wind and tongues of fire, as it were, rested on the heads of each one of them. Then, at that precise moment, At that very instant, they knew. And they knew where the kingdom was that he was talking about. And they burst forth from that room and did what he had instructed them to do without fear. And every one of them with the exception of one who even got himself boiled in oil to nobody's benefit. You know, every one of them was martyred. Strong men, as soon as the grace of God touches, proceeding into Lent, my beloved people, it is time for us to know, or to try to know, or to wish to know what this, what we are about. Lent and all of that is not just, well, it's Lent, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, we've got to do the other thing, we've got to go to church, we've got to say our rosary, we've got to go and say to the cross, etc., 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 and all the big things. Important, yes, they are. But the one and most significant thing that we have to keep up here in this wandering head of ours is what's happening in my heart. What is my intention? Why do I go to confession? Why do I go to Holy Communion? Why do I come in here and sit in this church, this building? Why do I do anything that I'm doing that the rest of the world does not do as I am doing? Why? And how easily am I affected by things that are absolutely unreasonable, absolutely erroneous, absolutely wrong, absolutely, absolutely. When I know that this is where it is, inside of my heart. And what is the quality of the love that exists in that heart? You hear of love in here all the time. Every Sunday, you hear about love. Every Sunday, you hear about love, love, love. What is love? Love is God. And you and I must think of him and him alone 
and everything we do must be for him and only for him. <coughs> I figure in on nothing. Nothing. That does not, again, we repeat, that does not take us away from our jobs, our work, our this or that, taking care of the garden, painting the house, um, taking a trip, going here, going there, going everywhere. That we're not hindered. But taking care of those individual uh, 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 items that we have to do can all be done in love. And only a man or a woman who has ever understood love and how it works knows exactly what I am talking about. And if you have never loved, if you have never known or learned how to love, you will never know what is being said to you. It's a serious matter that we are being called upon as we see this, our blessed Lord knew in the transfiguration that it was absolutely of the essence that the apostles, some of them at least, the principal one of course, and if, did he not deny him in spite of all of this? Did Peter not three times say, I do not know him? Our blessed Lord knew that they were going to see him hanging, bloody, torn, emaciated, naked. Yes. Yes. At the taunts of a bunch of boars. He knew that they were going to see him in that condition. And our blessed Lord wanted them to see only too well that hanging on that cross was not just a man, but God himself. And it was God who was bleeding, who was torn, who was ridiculed, and poked rid filthy fun at. It was God himself. This is what you and I must work to help make good. And all that you and I are asked to do is to give a speck of extra love, a speck of extra devotion, a speck of extra honesty, a speck of less hypocrisy. That's all that we are asked to do. And we can keep our pretty clothes, and we can keep our nice meals and our comfortable homes. All he wants is to look at us and see a smile on our face that indicates, dear God, I love you. That's all. And as we look upon him, God, hanging on that cross, bleeding, watering the ground with his blood. Dear people, 
Peter was afraid that that was going to happen to him too. And in spite of the fact that Peter knew, he did not want to be treated as his master was treated. My beloved people, you and I and us on both sides of this enclosure are asked to do the same thing. Are we ready? Are we willing? Are we able? And all of this fanfare and loveliness and importance and blah, blah this and blah, blah that, here I come, there I come, but you know, everywhere me, 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 everywhere me, hear me, there me, everywhere me, me. My beloved people, until we understand that we, I, and each one of you must decrease. He alone has to increase. And as we approach that fatal day and fateful day, Good Friday, when we come here and when we see him and one mortal sin, one, just one single solitary mortal sin because they bit an apple. How many of us in here can boast? of having committed in our lifetimes just one mortal sin. Love. It is not something to be afraid of. It is because we, in repentance and honesty and sincerity, have gone to him, regardless of all we have ever done, regardless. If, we, if our sins are as scarlet, we're told, all we have to do to overcome all of it is simply produce our love for him. That's all. And mean it. This is all that Lent demands of me and demands of you. We just simply have to love. He is the beloved. I am the lover. And my one occupation and preoccupation in my life as a lover is to please the beloved. And I will jump off of the steep cliff if my beloved wants that of me. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are we ready for that? The life of Christ, the love of Christ, there is nothing on earth that is better. And our world, with all of its magnificence and lights, all that underneath, underneath the mountain, why is it that those that are down there have such scowling faces all the time? Why? They have everything. Fancy cars, fancy clothes, fancy food, fancy houses, fancy places to go. They're traveling all the time. Why are they miserable? Why? And all that you need to change your face as compared to theirs is one little act of love.
and hurt people.